And there we go, all set. Welcome to everybody who's joining us now. We're gonna get started in a minute or two. This week's sessions are all on astrophotography for those of you who uh, didn't hear the news. Um, so, oh, and there I am in the background on YouTube. Perfect. Okay, so uh, we're going to be focusing on astrophotography and for that reason, we've got Paul Owen with us today. Paul is a member in New Brunswick and we met last year, about a year ago now. Yep. Um, and he's one of my favorite people to talk to about astrophotography. He's great at introductory astrophotography. Um, and he's, you re recently had a photo f featured in Sky News too, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. uh, a matter of fact, Mar yeah, March issue. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so it was kind of nice. So he's, he's absolutely wonderful. And conveniently, that amount of vamping has gotten us to 3.30. So we're good to go if you want to get, <laughs> get started, Paul. <laughs> All right. Well, good then. Um, all right. So if I could get um, my, my, can I get my screen as big as you? Oh, yes. Yeah. There you go. Paul is now the focus. Let's see here. Okay. I'm still seeing you large. Oh, yeah, there I am. There I am. Yeah, there's a delay, so, of course, of course. And, and now I have put you on spotlight. So even if I'm talking, nobody can see me because <laughs> you are the star, Paul. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Okay, I'm just going to put my camera. I might shift my camera back and forth a little bit here and there just because it's odd talking to one side and have my camera pointing at another. <laughs> uh, get that thing set up properly. Oh, worked good there yesterday, but today is giving me a hard time. There we go. I'm there a little tilted, but that's okay. So was the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Jenna, for inviting me to do this. Um, uh, I've been doing um, photographing stuff for, oh, I don't know, probably since 2013 that's related to astrophotography. And I started out with just taking pictures with a camera and taking pictures of the moon and all those kind of things. Like I think a lot of people will start if they decide they want to kind of do this. And, um, and I've just had some fun with it. Um, I am by no means an expert in any way, shape or form, but I have learned a lot of things um, along the way. And, uh, and I'll share some of those things today. And um, so if there are any questions, I'm, I'm certainly uh, happy to answer whatever you want to throw at me. Um, a little bit of um, a background as to what my major uh, interests are now is I'm doing a lot of deep sky astrophotography. That's where I spend most of my time when I'm doing this hobby. Um, I didn't start off as a um, uh, as an astronomy person. Where what's in the sky and where is this and how big is it? In my uh, sort of uh, introductory was to uh, how do I take a picture of that? That is very neat. I saw that in a telescope, but it didn't really look that great. It didn't look like a Hubble thing. How do I make it look like a Hubble thing? So um, so that's kind of where my interest was into it. So sometimes if I'm showing you something and if I'm showing you, say, um, a feature on the moon, I'm showing you the photograph of that feature on the moon, but I may not know exactly how wide that crater is or how deep those terrace walls are. Uh, uh, I'm actually starting to do that on the other side. So I kind of started backwards going forwards on it. So. Um, so just to give you an idea where I'm at with it and, uh, and help, help, hopefully I'll be able to lead you down uh, the path of the right things to do uh, in the beginning side of, of uh, astrophotography. So um, I guess what we'll start with is what most people think of astrophotography. They think of um, the things that you see in a magazine. So if I'm thinking of astro astrophotography, Orion comes to mind. I'm looking at that beautiful M42 nebula. It's beautiful, it's in color, it's just amazing. And that's what I think of when I think of astrophotography, picking pictures of that. But astrophotography really is basically two hobbies that are kind of joined together. There's photography, which a lot of people are photographers and maybe a lot of the people that are watching today love to take daytime pictures and have a camera and just like to do that. And so that's the photography side. And then there's the astro photography side, which is astro from astronomy. So basically taking pictures of astronomical objects in the sky. So, um, so when you marry those two together, there is a little bit of a learning curve because like daytime photography, you're taking pictures of things that are bright and full of color and you take your camera, you click the picture and then there it is. You got the beautiful picture, you go home. With nighttime photography, not quite the same. 
Um, and it depends too on what you're trying to take a photograph of. So if it's something like the topics we'll cover today or taking pictures of the moon, uh, maybe some Milky Way shots, some star trails, uh, those kind of things, then those things you can get for the most part, you can get instant gratification with them. It takes a little practice and I'll cover some techniques and some settings as to how to do that. <clears throat> but even backing it up a little bit more, if you don't have a, a DSLR camera or a camera that you can take the lens off of, that could be a mirrorless or whatever. If you don't have that type of camera, if you only have a cell phone, well then you can still do lots of things with a cell phone. And um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you some things. I'm not gonna go through slides uh, on this segment. I just want to kind of physically show you what I have here and show you how most people come to us when we're out doing outreach and they come to either a star party or they come to a place where we've got a telescope set up and they said, oh my gosh, can I get a picture of that moon or can I get a picture of Saturn or can I get a picture of Jupiter? And we're saying, you know what? Yes, absolutely. Do you have a cell phone? And most people do. So, um, so this is where we can kind of get started um, first. So I have my cell phone. And like yours is probably very similar. It's either an Android or it's, a, or it's an Apple, it doesn't make any difference. It's the camera that we're interested in. So, um, so most of these cell phones have a camera on the front and a camera on the back. And uh, typically the camera on the back is the one that gives us the best, uh, the best pictures. So how we take a cell phone like this um, and take a picture, well, a lot of people think, well, if I have a telescope, now I'm gonna stand up, I'll keep an eye. And this is why I want to, see myself so I can make sure that you can see what I'm doing here in my tiny little room that looks big in there. <laughs> okay. You've got a lot of telescopes in that small room. Uh, you know what? It's, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I feel like I should be on that hoarding show. <laughs> Go back this way. There we are. I'm just trying to get us so you can see. Okay. So what I have here, first of all, this is just a spotter scope. So if any, I'll just turn my camera up a bit now. <laughs> So if any of you folks out there um, are birders, and I am, I love going out and taking pictures of the birds and all that wonderful stuff that you do in the run of a day. And lots of us have spotting scopes so that when we're looking at the birds, you know, we can get nice and close and so on. Well, your spotting scope will make an absolutely wonderful telescope if you want to take pictures of the moon. Um, so basically what it is, and I'm going to take this device off here, first of all, I'm getting ahead of myself. So basically you have a spotter scope, which is the same thing as a telescope, except it's just a little more compact and it gives you upright and um, correct uh, vision of what, you're, what it is that you're looking at. Because in the daytime, if a bird's flying that way, you want to follow them the proper way <laughs> in a telescope. You might be going the other way and you might be a little confused. So, um, so what we have here is a spotter scope. Now I have this pointed outside and I'll, I'll try to put my phone in on it and I'll see if I can focus on just something out there we can recognize. I don't know if I can or if I can't, we'll see. There we go. I'm just a part of the upright in my observatory. There. You have an, sorry, you're taking a photo of your observatory in the backyard? Yep. Oh, cool. I don't have an observatory yep. or a backyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had the backyard first. <laughs> It's a good starting point. Good place. But to you know start. what? If I move somewhere else, I probably would buy the observatory and then try to find it back. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, so yeah, so this is like a spotting scope. Now these are beautiful because um, you can go anywhere from 20 to 60 times zoom on this. And then there's a little focusing wheel on the front. So it's just kind of like a telescope. And if I didn't have a pair of binoculars, I'd be taking one of these out to, um, to look at the sky because they work just beautifully. So the first thing that you need to do this, um, and if you have, if you get one of these, you can go anywhere. And if you've got binoculars at home, it works on binoculars. If you have a spotting scope, it works on a spotting scope. If you do have a telescope or know somebody who does, um, then this will work on a telescope. And what this is, this is maybe a company called Celestron, and it's called the NexYZ. And basically, uh, it's got three axes on it, and that's why it's called XYZ. And um, I'll show you basically, so there's two buttons on here. One goes forward, backwards and forwards. This one goes side to side. And then this one down here goes, oops, up and down. And the reason it has all those axes is because what it's designed to do, it's designed to clip onto the eyepiece of your telescope 
the eyepiece of a spotting scope or even your binoculars because you can get binoculars and uh, set them up on a tripod and you can use this. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. So um, what you do here is you just unwheel this little lock and that opens up this clamp. Now this clamp is big enough to actually take on a two inch eyepiece or one and a quarter. So if you have a telescope, uh, typically most people with uh, small scopes are using one and a quarter inch eyepieces. But if you have a two inch, it doesn't matter. It'll work with both. So that's really nice. So all you do with it is you take it and you put it around your eyepiece. I'll get my hands out of the way so you can see that. And then that little orange button, all you do is you clamp on it. And then what that does, that gets a really nice bite over your eyepiece. So now we have a solid secure piece, nothing's changed. Then we're gonna take our cell phone and there's a little pull right here on the side, which allows us to drop our cell phone into it. I'll lock that up, there we go. So all we do is we just pull that back and we drop, whoops, drop our cell phone into it. I'm gonna turn my phone on to camera. Uh, camera, 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 there we are. Okay, so now um, what I have to do next is, and I'll turn this sideways a little bit so you can see what I'm doing, is you can see that my phone is, a, there's a fair distance between the phone and the eyepiece. So that button that goes up and down the, the wheel, so you can see I can get that nice and close to my eyepiece. So that's gonna roll into the eyepiece. Now I'm still off center a bit. So then these are gonna go back and forth and there. And, and once I've got a nice circle on my cell phone, I'm going to, and I'm going to show you this. I'll pull my camera over after I show you, but I just want to kind of get through what I have to get through here. There it is. And there's my corner on my observatory. And I'm just going to use that. And all you're going to see, whoops, is a piece of lumber. There we go. Okay, so now um, my, my cell phone is on. Uh, I'm all nice and focused. I can see a nice sharp image. So this would be the same thing exactly as if I was going to take a picture of the moon. This is exactly what would go on or Saturn or Jupiter, whatever it is that, that's in the telescope. And then um, I'm just going to move my camera. Excuse the, the camera getting kind of weird there. I got to move it. <laughs> so now I'm going to show you what you can see. So that's what I'm seeing through my, um, oh. through my cell phone. And I'm just going to get it so that it's, it'll take the brightness away because the camera's kind of, this camera's a little yeah. sensitive to light. There we That's go. That's beautiful. That's so cool. Yeah. So then all you do there, um, once you've got that done, you've got, say, the oh, moon in that nice circle. And then you just press the button, click, and there's my picture. Awesome. That's it. Fantastic. It's just that simple. Now I'm off to the next telescope to go take a picture of something else. So, <laughs> so sorry. So that's how easy... There we go. That's how easy it is to take your cell phone and uh, use a little device like this, put your, your cell phone on there and then you're all set. I'll show you now that little circle a little further. There we go. Right now I'm just taking a picture of the wall, but, <laughs> but you can see that's basically all there is to it. So, and so that's what this device does. It see how I move it around and it goes in and out of that circle. So this, uh, we've used a lot of these um, out here, out East. Um, you probably heard of Chris Kerwin from Astronomy by the Bay. He uh, uses this exclusively now when he does his outreach and when he does his live feeds, when he's doing his uh, moon talks and so on, that's what he's using is this XYZ thing. He puts it on his eyepiece of his telescope and then he just talks away about the moon or the Saturn or whatever, whatever is that he's on. That's amazing. So, I have, yeah. a, just quickly, if, if you don't mind, I have a couple questions from the sure. comments about a few things. Sure. Um, first of all, do you know how much the, the Celestron XYZ cost or XYZ costs? Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, the cost of these is pretty low. Uh, we bought these from a place called Learland Nature, which is now Astronomy Plus in Montreal, okay. and uh, it's seventy nine dollars. Okay, perfect. So they're, and, so they're very reasonable. Okay, sounds good. And someone just said that it's also available on Amazon, but I do support local retailers, so I encourage you to buy from Montreal. Um, <laughs> and Absolutely. Then, and then the other the other question was um, out of from Maury Portnoff in Ottawa or sorry Ottawa um, Montreal, uh, what model spotting scope is that, and has the image quality compared to a DSLR with like a good telephoto lens? Um, well, uh, it's this one's a Bushmaster Spotter twenty. It's a two o six o six o. Um, it's not a really high end, uh, model. I mean, you can get some ones with some really nice glass in them and takes care of uh, chromatic aberration and all that. This one's not like this. This one's just for just a quick grab, go have a peek and put it away. Cool. Um, but if I was using a DSLR, uh, oh yeah, the, the, the pictures would be absolutely totally different. 
but it does seem like it's a great option either for people who do outreach with the RISC or even for someone who's really interested in space but can't afford a telescope Absolutely. to grab with them and then go to star parties and ask if they can attach them. Yeah, um, you, yeah, because you can get these at um, uh, at any department store, really. And it's not like you're going out and buying a high-end telescope. And just like uh, Jenna was saying, what's really neat about this is between this and, your, and this device here, and if you've already got a tripod for your camera, because that's just on a camera tripod, uh, you're talking less than $200. That's really great. That's really yeah. reasonable and affordable. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, there was a question as well saying, will it hold a Canon power shot, which I'm pretty sure it wouldn't, eh? Um, no, no, that's designed for cell phones. Okay. So yeah, because it, it's designed, if you look at the design of it, it's just very, very small. And the, the way that it, that it holds onto things, it just holds very flat things. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't hold a camera like that for sure. Okay. What a lot of people do though, if they want to use their camera to do this type of photography is they have um, a second tripod and they just mount the camera on the tripod and then they just put the camera up to the eyepiece, just like I showed you on here, <sighs> line it all up and you can go ahead and take a shot that way. That makes sense. I have tried the whole like balance your phone in front of the thing and it's oh it's hard oh it's Good hard yeah. <laughs> yeah unless you've got steady hands boys because nope. it's you have to get it exactly lined up and and if you move a little bit then it goes out it's, it's just so difficult so that's a that's a great option absolutely yeah uh any other questions there uh, I think that covers it. Um, there's one question about working on binoculars, but you said, yes, it does, right? It, yes, it does. Yeah, okay. it works exactly the same as this. This really is just a monocular. If, if I had a set of binoculars, it'd be two of these. That's all. So it works exactly the same way. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That's great. That's it for questions. Oh, wait, hold on. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's it for questions on uh, what you've been saying. Yes. Oh, sorry? That is it for questions on oh. the Celestron XYZ. Next okay. YZ. All right. I do want to show you on, uh, on the cell phone. Um, there is an app that you can get. So if you do want to take uh, longer exposures, um, and I'm going to see if you can see that on there. Let me see if I can go back far enough. Maybe you can. It's this one right here. It's called Deep Sky Camera. And what that does, it's, a, it's an app that you put on your camera and it'll allow you, if your camera doesn't have a lot of manual control, it'll allow you to go in to set up, um, set, use your camera manually. So if you wanna change your ISO, if you wanna change your shutter speed, all of that kind of stuff, uh, you can do that just on that little app. It's a free app, it's a download. And then all you have to do is get a, put your camera on a, a tripod and you can buy just like a little clothespin clip for it put your camera on the tripod like that. And then you can go ahead and take Milky Way shots and all that stuff, a really nice wide angle and be able to adjust your camera totally manually. Very cool. You said it was called Deep Sky Camera? It's called Deep Sky, Cam Deep, Deep Sky Camera. Let me just open it, make sure I got the total. Deep Sky Camera Beta. Okay, all right. Can you see that? Uh, let's let it focus for a second. No, I guess I can't get it to focus. It's just That's perfect, now we can anyway, see it, yeah. yeah. Deep Sky Camera Beta, and it works absolutely just beautifully, just okay, beautifully. Perfect. So um, so that's kind of cell phone talk um, that I was gonna kind of cover with you because there's not a lot um, personally that I do with cell phones other than that, but the procedure is the same uh, if you're using telescopes or um, binoculars or, uh, or spotter scopes, that, that's how uh, uh, you can use your cell phone and, and you know, take advantage of that and get some really nice images. Lovely, thank you. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, we kind of like that. So I'm going to put that out of the way. The nice thing, especially with cell phones, is that almost everybody has them these days. And even if the camera is not great, or for a long time, for example, I had a camera that was broken because I am careless. <laughs> um, even, even still, it worked really well. And, and like, I got a really cool photo of Jupiter and its moons at a star party at the Science Center once. And it was like, Oh my the best gosh. day of my life. It was so cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, the neat thing about it too, is once you take the, the, the picture, then you can just automatically share it with your friends and that kind of stuff. Cause that's really what this hobby is all about is, yeah. is, uh, is sharing stuff and having some fun. Right. For sure. Okay. So then um, if there's no more cell phone stuff, then let's get into some DSLR stuff. Um, let me just find it here. And I think, that's the one. No, actually, you know what? We'll do star trails first because star trails are fun. Star trails are very popular on the internet okay. these days. So let's um, figure out how I share that it's right there. Share screen. And I want to share this one. Okay, good. 
So now um, I'm just going to start with um, a picture of a star trail. And can you see that? Is that uh... We absolutely can. Okay. So this is a, a star trail shot that was taken from my backyard and um, oh, a couple of years ago now. Um, and the neat thing about star trails is it really gives you an opportunity to have a look at how the earth rotates. And because basically um, how things move around us is it's, it's, the, it's the stars aren't moving, it's we're moving. And of course, we're rotating from um, uh, west to east. And because we're rotating from west to east, everything seems to appear to be coming from east to west. So we have this rotation. So up here in the northern part of uh, the hemisphere, we're blessed with Polaris, which is the North Star. And for us astronomers, uh, or astrophotographers rather, that's <laughs> that's worth its weight in gold, that thing. And we hope it doesn't move. Well, it won't move in our lifetime, but <laughs> but in any event, that is uh, that is the center. I'm going to use my mouse, if you can see my mouse pointer. Yep, we can see. Okay. So that is actually Polaris right there. Um, and that star, although it moves, but to our, our perspective on the ground, standing up, looking at it, it doesn't look like it moves at all. And everything rotates around Polaris and thus creates these star trails. So basically, I'm just going to show you on the next slide. If I was off axis of the Polaris, so Polaris would be up here in the top, and but I wanted longer trails, then I would take my camera and I wouldn't, I would put my, my focal point somewhere in the center, like right around this area here. And now I'm getting much, much longer, more dynamic trails. So, um, so it's not just one kind of star trail shot you can do, you can do all kinds. If I was to point the camera between um, say the uh, Western sky, which would put me right between the North and the South pole, the stars would trail again in, in a different manner. So there's a lot of different ways you can play around with star trails. Now I want to show you a little video of how I took that first picture. So keep in mind that on this video, it's not moving yet, but right there in the center, that's Polaris. So this is what happens in that period of time, the amount of time it took me to take this photograph to get that star trail. I'll play the video. So you can see the, the earth or the, uh, yeah, the earth is rotating and you can see how those stars are moving. Oh, wow. So what's happening, of course, is that it, it appears that things are rolling east to west, but in actual fact, we're turning towards <laughs> that. Um, so if you're not sure what that is, um, and because the other thing you'll find when you're taking nighttime shots with your camera, and it's a little hard to get focused sometimes, but um, is when you take a nighttime shot like that, that shot was like 30 seconds, you're going to see a whole lot more stars than you would see just standing out there naked eye. So because of that, um, sometimes you get lost in the stars. I remember going to a star party and two of us, two of us thought Polaris was another star. <laughs> so oh, we aligned no. our telescopes <laughs> on another star. There was, it was the first time I was in a really dark sky and I said, oh my gosh, I can't even see the con. You get used to it after a while, but. That I actually, I had that problem once when I was uh, trying to tell people how to find their way around the night sky. Cause of course I'm from Toronto where you can see like three constellations and they're really <laughs> obvious. And then I'm like, and then I got out into a dark area and I was like, well, geez, they're all hidden now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where'd they go? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to show you in the next slide where they're actually hiding. So there's the Big uh -huh. Dipper and there's Polaris. So if you look right here, if you're familiar with um, um, Ursa Major, right on the corner of the handle is two stars, Mizar and Alcor. And those ones there are... Um, Actually, they're a little bit of, a, of an eye test. If you can see that years ago, you know, that you, you had a vision that was, you know, allowing you to do certain things, maybe if you're going to go out to sea or something like that. Um, but in any event, that's, uh, that's uh, the double of the uh, stars, uh, I, Miser and Alcor. And then, of course, Polaris. So everything just kind of rolls this way. So when I go back to that slide, now we'll watch it again. And you can kind of see Polaris a bit. There's the bowl. And there's the little curl up to Polaris. There's the Mizar and Alcor. I'll play that video again. And this used, and you're seeing things up on the corner. That's airplanes flying by. <laughs> Are you close to the St. John Airport? Um, I'm sort of <laughs> uh, like like where the the, the the jet stream, of course, goes um, uh, yeah. uh, sort of west to east here, uh, or everywhere, I guess. But uh, but anyway, over my house, I have a. <laughs> 
constant flow of planes. <laughs> yeah, there's planes a lot. So sometimes I'm taking pictures out when I don't want them. But in any event, um, yeah, so that's how that rotates. Now, to give you an idea to go back to the original picture, this one, to take um, a photograph like that, if you have to kind of start doing the math because when I'm playing back that little short video clip, I'm playing that back at 30 frames every second. So, and if you look at the time, um, that video, the length of that video clip, that video clip was seven seconds long. So you think of seven seconds, <laughs> really? Well, if you do the math on it, seven times 30, and then you get the numbers and you break it back down. That seven second shot took an hour and seven or an hour and three quarters. Wow. Because there was 200, what did I say? There was 210 frames I had to take all at 30 seconds. And when you put them all together and run it in that kind of speed, uh, yeah, that's all you're getting. So when you wow. see these absolutely wonderful, you know, five to 10 minute um, uh, Star Trek or um, time lapses, those guys are out there from basically as soon as it gets dark to almost when it gets light. Wow. Just to get that little five minute clip or seven minute clip. So yeah, it takes a long, long time to do oh these. Goodness. And that, that answers a couple of questions in the, in the comments. A lot of people are asking about ca specific camera settings, um, which okay. I think you're going to talk about settings later, right? I'm actually, I'm going to, I'll probably slide right into that actually. Oh, perfect. Yes. I did that on purpose. We, okay. we planned ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so basically I want to show you this one too. This is not my photograph. This is somebody else's, but just to give you an idea how creative you can get because of um, if, if, and of course I don't live around the mountains like you see there. Uh, so if it was in Canada, probably chances are it's out in Alberta or, or uh, uh, Vancouver, somewhere around there. But the beauty of that shot is, um, is you can see the star trails. You can see where North Polaris is, which we always see be up on the corner. That's where the center uh, of that, those circles are. But you'll notice that the clouds aren't moved. So what's this person's done is they've actually made a composite image of a photograph uh, with those clouds in it, and then either did the star trails first or second. I'm not sure, I don't know how, the, how it was composed. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's fantastic to, if, especially if you're a photographer who's got a little bit of skills and you don't mind doing some, um, some processing, which you'll see uh, on Thursday with uh, Dave, I think it is. Um, yeah, but in any gonna... event, um, this is this is absolutely just beautiful um, to, to do that. So all you're doing is taking a couple of photographs and blending them together. And you can come up with some really, really nice artistic things you can hang on a wall and be very proud. Wonderful. Yeah, I just wanted to show That's that. That's really cool. Okay, so let's get into what does it take to take a photograph of a star trail? Well, the first thing you're gonna need is a camera. Second thing you're gonna need is an intervalometer if your camera doesn't have one built in. Some of the cameras today now have an intervalometer. If you don't know what an intervalometer is, it's just basically a, it's a remote control device that plugs into your, the side of your camera and it allows you to take a shot, take a break, take a shot, take a break, take a shot, take a break. And then it, and you can tell it how many photographs you wanna take. So what it does is it allows you to set up your shot punch all that information in that you want and then push a button and then you walk away. You can go sit there and enjoy the night while your camera's taking those shots. So that's what an intervalometer does. Then you're gonna need a tripod and the sturdiest tripod you can get the better because you want something really, really stable because if you're taking shots like this, you don't want any camera shake going on because that'll ruin your star trails or it'll ruin those images that, that, that got uh, moved from wind or something. Um, if you do have a lightweight tripod, then you can actually take a little um, uh, a plastic bag and fill it full of rocks and hang it in the center and that'll anchor your tripod nice and firm. So there's a lot oh. of ways you can get around that. So you don't have to replace your tripod if you already have one. Very cool. I like that. Um, a ball head. This is not really uh, necessary for doing star trails, but it does give you more flexibility as to how you place your camera. So if you do want a little bit of an angle shot or something like that, the ball head will give you that instead of just up and down and side to side, it gives you basically 360 degree movement. So it will give you some more flexibility. And you need your batteries. Don't forget your batteries. <laughs> how many times have I gone out there? I'm all excited. I just got home. The sun has set, the moon's coming up. I go into the basement, I rush around, I grab my camera, I run outside and I go, no battery. 
<laughs> that's happened trust me or the battery that's in it is dead so if you're going to do the, this kind of okay. photography it's going to be hours so make sure your batteries are charged and if you have one or if you can afford to get one either get a second battery or what i like to use is get a battery grip so in a battery grip what that does that allows you to open up the side of that um, battery thing and you can actually put two batteries in there close that up and then you know you're good for the night because what happens is if you're shooting in the winter time the winter where it's so so cold especially up here in in our part of the woods um it'll actually uh, uh deplete your battery energy quicker than as if it was in the summertime so um so if it's really really cold and it's in the winter and you want to do some nice shots uh make sure that you got enough battery power just a just a heads up while we're here. I went out to visit Paul in May last year, as I mentioned, and I was taking photos and filming, and I left my battery at my friend's house oh, that no. time. Yeah, so I had to go call my friend and have him drive the battery down to me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing worse than that. Eh? It's, it's funny. Oh. It's the little things that can make a big thing not work. Eh? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Well, that leads me to my next slide because my next slide is about memory. And even though mine's not good, if I had to put one in my brain every day, I would get the biggest card I could put. <laughs> yeah. The reason being is this, with star trails, there's um, a number of different ways you can take them. And there's a number of different um, um, formats you can shoot with. So if you're gonna take a really, really long trail, well, you're gonna want the, you know the capacity to put those pictures in there but secondly and more importantly is if you're going to shoot in raw which takes way more uh, memory than jpeg then you want to make sure you've got a battery card that you know i would try to go buy 128 meg or gigabyte card uh, 64 minimum and then you you never have to worry about running out especially if you use that same uh, card in the run of the day and you were taking bird pictures or family pictures and you want to use that same card at night if you're shooting raw and you're shooting long exposures or, or a lot of long exposures you will eat up that battery uh, or that memory rather pretty quick so make sure you have that and always carry spare cards because sometimes memory cards can go bad and if they do it's nice to have another one that you can slip in there and memory cards are very inexpensive now so mm -hmm. so that's the thing on memory so those are the things that you need um <clears throat> and now we'll get into settings oh everyone's favorite subject okay so the first thing that you want to do when you're doing this kind of photography is have a manual setting in your camera so you can see this one here this person switching this over to m which is manual you want it in manual because when you're shooting this type of photography your camera doesn't work really great in automatic because you have to do a lot of adjusting and settings and these are things that the camera doesn't have the ability to sort out for you you have to do it so the first thing you want to do is set your camera up in manual so so, so these are the settings that I use to start with because that your sky could be different than mine. Um, the type of lens that you use could be not as light efficient, you know, so there's a few things you have to consider when you're when you're shooting trails, but this is a good uh, starting uh, starting thing. So if your exposure is going to be anywhere from 50 to 60 minutes in a stack, um, the aperture on your camera, which is basically how you open or make the, the, the whole of the, the lens bigger or smaller. In this case would be, would be F4. If you have a kit camera, a camera that you bought that comes like in a kit, like some of the Canon ones or the Nikon ones or the Sony ones, some of those lenses that they get with them, they only go down to like uh, F4 or F5.6 or something like that. So because they're not real light efficient, you may have to take a little longer exposure. And that's why I say this is sort of a, this is sort of a starting gate. So you may have to go plus or minus on your exposures and so on. On the opposite side of that, if you have a lens that's, um, you know, that'll go down to like F1.8 or something, that'll really open up very, very wide. And because it opens up wide, it allows a lot more light to get in. So if it allows more light to get in, then your exposure doesn't have to be as long. And then your ISO, which is that 100 to 400 um, down here that you got, so that's the sensitivity of the, of the, of the, uh, the sensor. So if the lower that you can put that, 
the better it is because then you're kind of getting away from noise and noise is one of our one of our enemies in the photography world all there's lots of ways to get around to taking care of it but but if you can get a, a noiseless image to begin with then you're way way further ahead of the game when you go to process these things um i want to show you um if i can and if there's questions jenna please um i'll stop and ask them right away so there's one but you can show us what you're going to show us first okay so I want to explain what f-stop is and give you an idea um, why it's so important in uh, nighttime photography and why when we're doing nighttime photography, we try to get um, a lens that's got the least, the smallest f-stop number. So um, this lens I have here is, uh, is an 85 millimeter. And oh, just suck. I'm, I'm holding this up so you can see it and I'm showing you my thing. My apologies. Mm -hmm. Let me, how do I stop sharing? My apologies there, folks. There, am I back on or is it? You're back on. Sorry, I should have warned you about that. I was enjoying the one inch <laughs> the view of you I had. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do these talks a lot of the time and I'm talking to people and I don't have to switch screens. They see me all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what I have here is an 85 millimeter. This is a lens made by Sam Yang. And these are one of the knockoff companies that make really, really good lenses, Sam Yang and Rokinon and so on. Anyway, this is 85 millimeters. And I want to show you um, if I had an F. 4.5 or 5.6 because that's what a lot of those kit lenses are so i'm going to put this up and i want you to can you see the hole yes okay so that's as wide as this lens would open up that's the, that so if i've got a kit lens that's as large as that could possibly get so that means that i don't have a lot of light going in so that means i have to up my sensitivity and i have to up my shutter uh, my exposure length to get the, key, the sensor to get enough light to get a, to get an image. Now, let me show you if I had this lens and I could put it down to 1.8. Oh, look at that. Whoa. You see the difference? So that is wide open. Look at the size of that aperture. That's huge. And that's why when you go to a, a lower um, F, F number, you're opening up that glass. So it's like, if just like a telescope, you go to a, like an eight inch uh, Dobsonian, it's a light bucket. And mm -hmm. that's why you can see more fainter details because you've got a bigger piece of glass collecting a lot more photons. And that's how basically a lens works. So you can imagine now, I'll go back down to the F4, see how it's stopping that down? I'm trying to get out of the way so you can see the light. <laughs> there it that's is. That's perfect, yeah. So I'm trying to stop that down. And as you can see, that's about 5.6. Look at the difference. It's wow. unbelievable. So that's why it's so important. Um, if you have a kit lens, uh, chances are it's going to be somewhere in that vicinity of uh, f5.6 or maybe even f4. So, and that's not to say that it doesn't work. It does work, but you have to use a little different math to make it work. Mm -hmm. That's wild. I've never, I've never seen someone hold up the camera lens so you can actually watch the aperture. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, and that too, by the way, is, um, is what they call a prime lens. And because it's a prime lens, it's like it's not a zoom. Um, there's a lot less glass to go through. So the images are sharper. You know, it's just for this type of photography, it's just so much better because you really don't need to zoom for this type of photography. So. Right, yeah. Okay, um, cool. okay. So the question that uh, Alan Boyce was asking in um, when you had your uh, slides up there a second ago was, um, it said it was five to 60 minutes per stack. Is that for the entire stack or is that for each? Oh, okay, let me go uh, back to that, sorry. Um, no, that's okay. Is that, was your plan to go back to those slides? I, I will, I can, or I, I don't, well, I can, I can stay here for now. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so that was a five to 60 minute stack. So the reason that you say that, because you it, the, the length of that time will determine how long your trails are gonna be. So if you just want short trails, then you can go ahead and take a five minute shot a set of exposures if you want, but you're not going to get a whole lot of movement there. You'll get some, not a lot, not much more than if you were taking a picture of a Milky Way and then you saw some stars trailing in the background. But it's when you go up to the 60 minutes or more, like the, the, the photograph I showed you that I took was uh, an hour and three quarters. And you can see how long those trails were. So if you really want to get really something that's really, really long trails, then uh, you're going to have to shoot for a lot longer period of time. So that's what that, that meant. 
I hope so that answers the, the question. It's the whole stack and not individual exposures. The individual exposures are about yeah, 30 seconds each. Yeah. And now that you brought that up, that I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there's two ways you can shoot um, star trails. You can shoot it, just put your camera on a tripod, leave it open and let it stay there for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half hour, whatever you want. The trouble is, is your uh, camera lens or your sensor rather is going to heat up. And number two, if something goes across your frame, you've ruined it and you've only got one picture. But if you take a series of these shots, like I was talking about using that intervalometer, intervalometer, then what happens is if you've got something that happened that the wind came up and shook the camera for one frame, well, as you go through and you can say, oh, that frame's terrible, throw it out. And then you still have all of those frames you can stack up and still keep your image nice and clean. Okay, cool. Good to know. Um, um, and there was one last question, which was, and I, I think this is a no, um, do kit lenses work better to take pictures of a star trail? I guess better than like taking pictures of deep sky objects? Um, I'm not sure what better than means, um, but kit lenses work well. Um, it, it's really, when you're using a kit lens um, for this type of, uh, uh, of photography, I guess the thing you have to consider is, is how, wide you can get that aperture but if you got a camera that's got you know a good sensor in it and you know it's it's uh not overheating you're not getting a lot of noise and stuff then a kit lens is absolutely fine for this type of photography it, it really is i started out with a kit lens and it worked great in fact you can buy um through canon um a 50 millimeter prime lens f 1.8 so it's got that nice wide aperture but it's only 50 millimeters and that's what they call the nifty 50 uh mm -hmm. lens and that a lot of um astrophotographers use because it's a very wide angle it's a prime lens and it's super clear super clean and it's like 150 dollars brand new okay cool wow yeah. fantastic thank you yeah. um there's some there's some really technical questions i'm going to save those till the end um and if I know Peter Visma has been answering a couple technical questions in the comments. He's one of the, he's a photographer from Toronto Center. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so if, he, if Peter, if you have answers to these technical questions, uh, jump on in. And then if they're still unanswered by the end of the session, I will ask Paul. Is that Peter Visma? Yes, it is. Yeah. Hey, Peter, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that kind of covers um, star trails. Other than I did want to um, slow, show one more slide because there's two uh, places that once you're got once you've got your um, your data in your in your chip, obviously you want to put it together and you know and, and that's a whole other topic. I won't get into that today, but I did want to show um, there. So I just want to show you that. So um, so use the exposure time for all of your exposures. Use this exposure time for all your exposures. So what that simply means is that if you're going to go out and shoot star trails, make sure that if you're using 30 seconds, you don't alter from that. You stay 30 seconds for the whole run uh, and just keep shooting a lot of frames. Be careful not to move the camera at all between exposures. And again, because if you do, then all of that stacking that you're going to do, because you have to put one picture on top of another, you're going to, you're going to ruin that. So you have to either get rid of the frames that were moved, that were jarred, or if you move the camera totally, you're going to have to choose what set of, of, of data that you want to keep. Um, so later on, you're going to put all these together in short exposures in Photoshop. So there's a fellow named Chris Shures, uh, and he's got this star trail action, which is one uh, set of software where you can stack this stuff up. Or there's a freeware called Star Trails from uh, uh, Akeem Shaler. And th that program is designed to create the equivalent of one long exposure. So you take all your exposures and you can put them all together so that you can blend them all together and get that nice star trail image. Um, Paul, would you be able to send me those links after the talk and then I yeah, can certainly. put them up on our website? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. So I'll put that up at rask.ca slash right now. It's still homebound hyphen astronomy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, although we have changed the name to Insider's Guide to the Galaxy, just didn't want to confuse people with URLs, but it'll be up there uh, once the talk is over. Thank you, Perfect. Paul. Perfect. Okay. So that was, um, that was it for Star Trails. If there's, is there any questions on that now or is that pretty much it? I think um, that was pretty much it. I do. So um, Alan Boyce, before you mentioned that, did ask whether or not we'd be going over software. Um, we're not going to go in, and you already said we're not going to go into it in depth, but I wanted to let everybody know that, tom not tomorrow, Thursday, um, David Schumann is joining us to talk about introductory Photoshop. So if anybody Perfect. wants to just take a look at some introductory Photoshop stuff, 
come and sign up for that. That's exactly. Show. And uh, and uh, and I thought where that where he's doing that on Thursday, he could probably handle some of that stuff um, because that in itself will take a whole other session or yeah, could take a whole other session because it, it's it's not really technically hard to do, but you got to know your way around the software to be able to stack things up. That's all. For sure. And and it's, I think, I'm not sure if he's going to go over it. I think he's focusing on um, other sort of aspects of it, just stacking static okay. images, but mm -hmm. we'll see. And if there's interest again, we're going to try to stay flexible with this as we are stuck in our homes and we're bored <laughs> and we want to share things with people. So if we can convince Paul and David to keep coming back to uh, help us out with this stuff, then we may be able to offer more sessions. We'll see. Yeah, that absolutely. Happens. Yeah. If somebody wants to see some, some processing uh, in that, you know, that Dave's not covering, you know, I'd be happy to do it. So okay. we'll figure it out. We'll work together on it. Exactly. Okay. So um, how are we doing for time? We got about eh, 15 more minutes. Um, okay. Yeah. We'll see if it runs a little long. It's not the end of the world. All right. So what I want to do next. Um, oh, before I do this next slide, I just want to show a couple of fun photos. Uh, just to show you that it's um, this. This is just a hobby that is just absolutely just so much fun. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to show some photographs. So, what I'm going to show here are some shots that we took uh, down at uh, St. Dress Beats in St. John, New Brunswick, and this was the night that um, Jenna was here, and uh, Jenna was here and. Um, uh, uh, Reed. Uh, oh, uh, John. John. John Reed. John Reed. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry, John. I forget your first name. Uh, <laughs> John Reed from uh, 50 Things. You can see through binoculars and or telescopes. You get some wonderful books. Anyway, you guys were here, and then we had a whole bunch of people from our club, and it was just at the beach. And the night couldn't have been better. It was a clear night. And it was a lot of fun. So I just want to show some of these some of these pictures. So let's see. Am I sharing there now? Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of, if you if we're looking to the west, the sun is setting, and this is one of our astronomer fellows from uh, from our club in, in out here in St. John, and uh, he was getting ready. He was watching the sunset and eagerly waiting for the sky to get dark so we could take some uh, some fantastic pictures and all kinds of people there for observing. It was just so much fun. And that night we had a really really thin crescent moon too. That was the I think the thinnest I've ever seen the crescent moon. It was beautiful. It oh, was so beautiful. Cool. I, I'm going to show you a picture of that. Oh, yay. Okay. And uh, there's John right there, actually. Oh, yeah. And I don't know where you are in this one. You're around here somewhere, but there's I, a lot there, of people. I'm, I'm, I'm hidden in the back. I'm, I'm <laughs> hidden. Yeah. <laughs> and that's Kurt Nason from our club. And uh, Chris, Chris uh, there's Jim. Anyway, there's all kinds of folks there. We were having a, just a wonderful, wonderful time. It was fantastic. And this was uh, just, was just before it got dark. And there. Oh. There's Lovely. Jenna. She was working. So for us, <laughs> Toronto, Jenna was a working girl. She was keeping uh, herself busy doing what she should. Yeah, and it was a fun night. It was. So basically, there was a beautiful sunset. And this was on a, a, a crescent moon night. So it, it was just a magical night to have. And that's uh, Jenna talking to Chris Kerwin from Astronomy by the Bay. And, okay. um, and we, we just had an absolutely wonderful time there. That was something else. And oh, there's... <laughs> There's Mike and Chris. Um, we had some props in a van. So I said, take your stuff out. We'll do some pictures. That's some fun. So I took this photograph of these guys taking this and then I just painted in the center with uh, with some Photoshop stuff having fun just to show that these guys are actually light painting. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So cool. <laughs> That's yeah. Chris and Mike from uh, the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. Those guys are so much oh, fun. Great. I am going to, I'm just finding that link right now. So I'm going to send out the link to um, Chris's astronomy show. Okay. Chris and Mike, hold on. Yes, so keep going. I'll send it out in a second. All right, and I think, and there's just another picture you can take if you want to get creative. That was a conjunction quite a while ago, Jupiter and Venus. And again, you can just take pictures, put your your scopes and stuff in the front, and you know, just have some fun with it, right? I love and that. I love it. There's all this because it's not just taking pictures of space; it's taking pictures, and it just so happens that the subject matter is space. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and so it doesn't have to be, um, you know, a Hubble photograph to be considered an astrophotographer. I know lots of astrophotographers that don't have telescopes. They purely take stuff like this. And there's yeah. that crescent moon that you were talking oh. about. That's the one from that night. That's gorgeous. Oh, it was it was That's a magical so cool. night. It really was. 
So thank you for coming down and doing that because you, you sparked a lot of fun for a lot of people for that weekend. Thank you for having me. And if I hadn't, I don't know if I would have, we would have had the chance to do this if I hadn't come down to visit because I, I was, it was the opportunity. It was the time that I met Paul. That was the best part about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was so fun. Okay, so let's get into um, some other kind of photography. And there we go. So can you see that? Am I still sharing? Yes, we can see Okay. It. So this is the kind of photography that you can get into with a camera and some and a lens and a tripod and just a little bit of creativity so um anytime there's a a, a moon like whether it be a super moon a harvest moon or any kind of full moon because all the full moons have some kind of a uh, of a handle attached to them um they're fun to take photographs of and it's so much more fun to put something in the foreground as opposed to just taking a picture of a glob in the sky because i mean really it's it's nice especially if you can get up close and look at detail but for the most part if you're not if you don't have a telescope and you have a camera that's got a limited amount of zoom then these kind of photographs you can take and these are just so much fun to do um that one was taken with a with a zoom lens i think i can get the properties on that and see if i can get it yeah, so there we are. So that was taken with a, a Canon 6D Mark II. That's what I use for this shot. And ISO 250, 125th of a second. And my uh, aperture was set at F10. And the reason F10, because when the moon is that bright, you're going to be stopping your lens down. Otherwise, you're just going to have a white ball with no detail at all. So, um, so the point behind this was um, it was still, uh, you can see if you, I don't know what your camera people or the, the screen showing out there, but you can see there's still some snow on the branches, oh, that yeah. kind of stuff. So it was just a kind of a magical part of the night where it was coming up and made for a very, very nice photograph. So again, uh, very simple uh, settings on your camera and uh, you can get a photograph like that. Beautiful. This is this is the part that I really like where you don't need specialized equipment for it. Yeah, and that's, and that's the beauty of this. And, and the nice thing about this too, is if, you, if you're a traveler, you're someone who likes to get out and especially being out here on the on the coast is there's so much landscape to see and enjoy and lots of times you can't get to it by car you got to hike to get there and uh, because you can do this with your camera you can put everything in a backpack and yeah. then off you go so you can get to these places and not have to worry about try you know mounts and all this craziness just have some fun with your camera and you don't even need to have uh, a DSLR for this. If you got a, that Canon power shot or whatever the one that person talked about earlier, yeah. some of those kind of cameras, even your cell phone, you can pull off shots similar to these. So this one here, um, again, very, very simple. Um, it was just, uh, I don't know if I can show properties on this or not. Let's see. Yep. So this one I was using a Canon T3i. So it's it's a camera that's a, one of those kit cameras and it's got the smaller sensor and I'll show you sensor size if we have time to do that today. And um, because it's got a smaller sensor, it gives you what they call a crop factor. So things seem to be in a little bit closer. So if you've got, um, let's say um, 150 millimeter uh, zoom lens, if you put it on a crop camera, you times that by 1.6 and now you got probably 250 or close to 300 millimeters. So it actually pulls your, your picture in a little bit closer. So, um, so, and that's all this was. So I was very fortunate because this was the harvest moon coming up and this was at uh, that area where we were Jenna last year. Yeah. And um, the, the, the tide was gone out, which meant that the, the mud floor was all nice and glittery. Oh. So we got a beautiful reflection on the moon. And right over here, that's actually a lighthouse. And I was fortunate enough to have that light spin right at me when I shot, when I oh. pulled that shutter. Did so you plan made, that? What's that? Did you plan that? No. Oh, wow. <laughs> I could say, yeah, yeah, I planned. No. <laughs> <laughs> can't take, I can't take, uh, I'll take the luck of it. That's <laughs> no. a great photo. But yeah, it turned out very, very nice. So when you're doing this kind of photography and the photography for world, they say, if you can make triangles out of things. So we got the three things that are remain in this shot, which is the reflection, the moon and that light. And that kind of, you know, makes for a very, very nice photograph. And here's another one that's the opposite. Now, this is actually a moon set and this is a harvest moon set. So during that time, most of the times it's actually daylight before the moon sets down into the sky or into the horizon, I'm sorry. And some neat things happen when, uh, when, you, mm. when that happens. You'll see, first thing you'll notice is the moon's not round anymore. And it's got all these bumps and ridges on it. 
So what's happening is the moon is getting very, very low in the, in, the, in the horizon. And there's a lot of refracted light going on, a lot of light bending going on. And when that happens, the moon sometimes will take different shapes, different colors and all that stuff. So this is why a lot of photographers will shoot the moon either when it just comes up or when it's just going down is because you get that refracted light, which gives you some really neat colors and some really um, uh, some nice shapes and stuff. When you're doing a moon rise, like you saw in that uh, yeah, image before that moon realistically is like a red orange because it's it's going through that part of the of the horizon that part of the atmosphere and when you see a sunset that's a beautiful red sky it's the same thing in the same reason mm -hmm. so when you shoot those kind of moon shots um it's you know it's it's really really nice if you can get the horizon shots because you'll get a lot more uh, dynamic out of them for sure and i call this one a, this this hill had a moon bubble <laughs> oh amazing <laughs> Okay, oh. and this is another creative shot. Um, and this is using a little bit of uh, motion blur and um, or using motion in it, which creates a blur. So again, this was one of those shots where I, I wanted to take a picture. I don't know if I've got the um, properties on this one. Let's see. Yep. So this one was shot with a, a basic kit camera and it was shot with um, a basic kit lens at 36 millimeters. And it was shot at f4.5, and it was just a one-second shot ISO 200. So those, so that kind of setting created this. Um, and what was uh, planned was I figured out when the moon was going to come up. This is in Bloomfield, not far from my house, and basically said, "Okay, I'm going to get a shot of the moon coming over the bridge." But what I didn't count on was the traffic going back and forth. Mm. So what you're seeing there is a car going through and it, it was just so perfect because it did two things. It created the illusion that there was something flying through the bridge and we didn't know what it was. It was just a streak. It could have been anything. Uh, and also the car headlights lit up the inside of the bridge. So, um, so I didn't have to light paint or anything. I just took the oh. picture and then the car did all that for me. So, so that what you're seeing, good luck. <laughs> yeah, some more good luck. But when you're out shooting a lot, then luck starts to happen your way because you start to be in places where these things can go on, right? For sure. Um, another moon set. And this uh, idea was just to basically block out everything except for the silhouette of the trees and the moon. And look at the color of the moon. And that was the color of that moon as it was uh, setting. Wow. Unbelievable. Or is a rising. My apologies. That was a moon rise. Wow. That's something. Yeah, so, so, so again, um, getting back to the fact that you don't have to have a telescope, you don't have to be, um, you know, uh, an award winning photographer, this is just stuff you go out and just have fun with just click, 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 as Boomhauer would say, uh, on, <laughs> <laughs> on your camera, and you believe you, you won't believe the, the images you can get. This one was the, um, the pink moon from the other night. Oh, wow. Yeah, and this is out in Bloomfield. And this one, the reason I'm showing you this is because I want to talk a little bit about planning your shot. And um, where I live in this area, as you can see, it's relatively hilly. So, um, and now because I've been in the area, I know where the moon comes up. So mm -hmm. what I had to do was I just went on my phone and I just have this little app called Sun and Moon Rise Times. So I knew what time the moon was going to come up. I drove up to this spot took a few test shots to get the, you know, get it framed where I want it to be framed and just waited for the moon to come. And, uh, and it didn't disappoint. No kidding. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. You can so, even see the reflection in the, in the water there. Yeah. And you can see that there's pink all in, all in there. Wow. I did a little thing on Rosanna's uh, uh, fun facts the other night in the show. And it was all about the pink moon and why it was called the pink moon. And it's not because the moon gets pink. And I was fortunate enough that I had that beautiful sky where the sky actually gets a little pink before it gets dark, but it's because of the flocks. So there's certain flowers that grow uh, mm -hmm. and during this moon and those pink flocks grow. And then so it's called the pink full moon. There you so go. Perfect. So there you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, I do want to mention as well. So a couple folks have been suggesting various like tools and stuff like that in the comments. Um, Maury just suggested photo pills. Um, yeah. but it is not free. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you do want to use some free planetarium software, this is what the series has been about. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen this already. We've been using Stellarium. Mm -hmm. um, and so Stellarium is a really good way to plan these shots. You can figure out where things are going to be. Absolutely. I use Stellarium actually for all of my astro stuff, like all the deep sky stuff. I use Stellarium 100%. Um, and, and Chris uh, was 
you know, he gave some very, very amazing information. I learned a lot. I've been watching Chris's Stellarium uh, thing. So if he's going to do some more of it, watch because you learn how powerful that program actually is. There's an incredible amount you can do with it. Oh my gosh. Unbelievable. Yeah. And there's, um, um, I don't know how many hours old that moon was, but that's out here in Hampton. And again, just something that if you know what's coming, just look at your planetary, it's like photo pills is, is I think that's a, a program for doing some photo manipulation, I think. Is it? I'm not familiar uh, with it. I am not familiar with it. Um, it's an app. It's, so it sounds like it's a phone thing. It's an app available on both iOS and Android, says Maury. Yeah, okay. So um, for, th for this kind of planning that I'm talking about, this is more about where is it going to come up? What time is it going to come up? Mm -hmm. And where do I look? Those kind of things. So those apps, there's, there's quite a few of them that are out there. Um, and I've got a few that I'll, I'll, I'll include a little later. And that's another same one with just more of the sky in it. Uh, and, it, you know, again, these are shots you can plan. This is out in, uh, in St. Martin's area, another part of our wonderful uh, coastline. And this moon was just rising and there's an old lighthouse that was uh, just in really rough shape. And, but I thought, what a beautiful spot to take some photos. So really it's just a matter of doing a little bit of planning, uh, knowing when your moon's coming or setting, um, you know, uh, knowing that you can get to these locations. A lot of the software, or a lot of the apps that are out there actually have where you can find uh, your location. They got Google Maps tied right into it. They actually, if you want to look at, say, if I was downtown Toronto and mm -hmm. I want to know, is the moon going to be anywhere as close to the CN Tower? I can actually put that in and then actually uh, advance the time, like, like what Chris was doing on um, uh, Stellarium. But it actually has the landscape right there and it shows you the, uh, the ecliptic of the moon and the sun and how it, how it, how it is. So you can see exactly where it's going to be in front of that um cn tower at any time so That's you know that at 6 15 it's going to be right on the left hand side of the tower if i'm standing down on dundas street or something oh that's amazing i know that um one of our toronto center members and actually one of the rask national board members mike uh michael watson he went out at like four in the morning and he knew <laughs> he knew like where he had to be to get it was i think jupiter and venus on either side of the cn tower he knew about where he had to be but there were trees in the way it was a residential neighborhood so he's wandering around the streets of toronto <laughs> going okay where where is he gonna work yeah <laughs> yeah that's what you do <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely i think it's called i, I th i've got it somewhere else I'll, I'll find it for you anyway and I don't know that there's a lot more of this as opposed, oh, this one. Oh, beautiful. So, you know, everybody likes E.T., right? So when I shot this, I thought, geez, where's that little guy, and the little alien on the bike flying <laughs> past this, right? It's perfect for a movie poster. <laughs> <laughs> now see if I've got properties on this one. Yeah. So this was uh, the uh, Canon 60. So this is a full frame camera, but I did crop this in a bit. And uh, F6.3. Um, ISO 400, just one thirteenth of a second. And uh, I was using a zoom lens. Mm. So I was at 435 uh, millimeters to get that shot. So um, yeah, so it's just just experimentation and playing around with stuff. And here's just something artistic that I did years ago. And uh, first of all, we're not gonna see three moons, but um, there's a moon down here and then there's two moons at the top. So I thought, uh -huh. well, if I was on, uh, what was that planet and that Luke Skywalker was on? We had. <laughs> is it uh, is it Tatooine? I feel like Tatooine had like several suns. Several, maybe? several moon. Yeah, this, several yeah, that's moon. what it was. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so again, you can have some fun just doing stuff like that, right? And so, and that's out in Victoria, and uh, just topping the building with the moon in the daytime because daytime moons are are a lot of fun to shoot too. Beautiful. Um, and oh, sorry, I'll let you go. Yeah, sorry. No, no, <laughs> I, and I was just going to get back into equipment again. So. Um, so the equipment that you use to do star trails is the same equipment that you use to do shots like these. Um, or again, you don't even need as much as that because if you've got an, uh, a lot of the cameras today, the small compact ones, they've really got a lot of flexibility in them. They get super zooms for sure. And, uh, and they can go out a, a wide, a fair bit. And they've got a fair bit of flexibility in terms of how you can set them up. But typically for myself, this is what I use. Again, all the same things. Um, and these are apps that'll help plan your, um, your shoot. And that one down there I was telling you about that you can go and actually see what it looks like before you even go there is called Sun Surveyor. Okay. 
That's and uh, it's it's a it's a paid app. It's nine dollars and ninety nine cents, or it was when I took this screenshot. But <laughs> um, but it's well worth it if you're someone that is just loving to do this kind of stuff and does a lot of traveling. That's fantastic. And just a heads up to folks: if you've missed any settings or any details or anything like that, this video is up on YouTube, so you can always go back and watch over watch it over again. Um, there are a lot of folks asking for specific settings in photos and. Um, we only have so much time. We're actually, you know, quickly running out of time. And so the okay. key here and the big message, no, that's okay, Paul, you can keep going. Um, but the big message is uh, practice, try it. You know, we, we gave a couple examples. You don't have to use the exact same settings Paul used. Your camera is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Take some practice. And, and that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Because that's, it, it, that's how I came up with all this and a lot of, a lot of time spent on YouTube. Uh, learning and that's where I learned everything everything from my deep sky astrophotography to planetary to this stuff to bird shots I spend a lot of time on YouTube because there are so many people sharing their uh, their experiences uh, you can learn so much there so I can't recommend that enough and I just have a couple of slides to finish this one off um, I just want to show you the difference when you're shooting the moon with the different types of lenses so we're assuming that you're using a full frame on this one, even if it's an APS-C, it doesn't matter. Um, so at 100 millimeters, um, that's how big the moon would be in your frame. So it's not really big. So a shot like that, that would be one that I would use more. I would find a nice landscape to work with it and have the moon uh, in concert with a nice landscape. That's for that, that kind of a, of a zoom. If I'm going up to 200 millimeters, well, then now uh, it's getting a little bit bigger. I can see more detail on the surface. I can include that in a little closer, um, a closer shot. Makes for a very, very nice uh, picture. In fact, that one that, that I caught with the, um, the lighthouse on the beach with the light just at the right time, it was right around 200 millimeters, some was thereabouts. Okay. If you go up to 400 millimeters, uh, then you can start to see a lot of detail on the moon. So these shots uh, like this would be more like those nice crescent shots and so on and so forth. Uh, maybe if you want to get some what they call earth shine, where the mm -hmm. part of the, of the moon is all lit up by the, from the light reflected off the earth. And of course, that nice uh, crescent glow, which is lit up by the sun, uh, you can get shots like that. 800 millimeters, well, then you're getting into the league of a, of a telescope at that, at that stage. So. Mm -hmm. And I think that covers those two segments. That's a, a ton of detail. I really appreciate all the information about the moon. Laurie Roche from Victoria was asking specifically about moon photography. So um, that does a fantastic job of covering all that. Okay. Um, I'm gonna just mention to the folks who've been messaging in the chat, I have seen all of your recommendations. There are tons of recommendations for more things to do. Some people are very, interested in back focusing, which I don't even know what that is. So we're not going to cover it this time because this is beginner <laughs> astrophotography. And I consider myself a beginner astrophotographer. I don't know what that is. So we're going we're gonna to cover that later. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to mention too, which is um, uh, David Schumann, who's running the session on Thursday, said that he could briefly go over stacking for um, star trails in a different app before he does Photoshop. If folks mm -hmm. are interested and it sounds like that's something people are interested in. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll do our best to do that. Are you able to answer a few more questions, Paul? Or I am. Uh, before I do, I just, yes. I just, uh, I have on my screen here. Um, I, can you still see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So there are some settings for some basic things uh, just overall. So if somebody wants to screenshot this, they can. So there's a setting for constellations. There's a setting for twilight landscapes for Aurora and for Star Trail. So these are just all just really, really good basic settings. Um, and if I could show you a book um, that I recommend, um, and there's two of them actually. The, the one that I learned on when I first got into this and I can't recommend it enough and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for the time being. There we go, I'm back. Is um, this book and it's called Star at Night and it's by BBC and it's a magazine but it's actually a tutorial on everything astrophotography, including the topics we covered today, star trails, moon shots, uh, it'll get right into telescope moon, uh, close up, uh, planetary, deep sky, it covers all of it. And it's all um, step-by-step -step photographs, tells you about all the equipment that you need. And it's the best $17 you'll ever spend. Wow. Uh, and, 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 these, and, this, and they revive these, uh, um, about every 
two or three years because of the new technology that comes up with the different types of cameras and different techniques. So they keep uh, updating this, but it's from Sky at Night and uh, it's a BBC publication and uh, the, 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 the quality of the print is excellent. The information is second to none. And anybody who wants to cover uh, anything like that, I, again, I can't recommend that enough. Perfect. Thank you for that recommendation. That's a really useful one to have. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we'll do some questions. Okay. We have a ton of specific questions, which if we're going to get into heavy details, we're going to do that at a different set uh, in a different session. I have your questions. If you're super keen on having them answered, um, let me know. Paul, would you be willing to answer some like specific questions in email form if necessary? Uh, sure. Okay. So we'll yep. answer those specifically if we need to <clears throat> um, a little bit later. Um, a couple of folks asking about um, how, uh, this one's from Claudio, who's been helping me out building the robotic telescope website um, and is a member in Toronto Centre. Uh, if you have any suggestions on how to reduce light pollution in your uh, pictures, but without using filters, I can't think of any. Um, yeah, yeah, you can. Um, you're going to get the, if you got light pollution and you're not filtering it out to begin with, um, if you're using a DSLR, you might be able to uh, do a little um, white balance adjustment uh, on your settings or in post, uh, it's really simple. You can just go right up, take your, can your uh, photograph, throw it in post. So if you're using uh, uh, Lightroom, Camera Raw, Photoshop, any of those ones, you throw a picture in there and go, go automatic automatically to your white balance and just play around the image and just a click a spot. It's just a click and it'll automatically balance everything right out for you. So it'll take care of a lot of, because what light pollution does, it, it doesn't take away the image, but it actually puts another cast over the front of it. And it's usually um, uh, an orange glow or a brown glow or something along those lines. Uh, unless you're getting into gradients, well, then that's a whole other topic. But but just if it's light pollution that's coming from a certain area, it's usually some kind of a glow. And usually with a white balance, you should be able to take care of, you should be able to take care of that. Perfect. Thank you very much. That was an excellent answer. I was ready for, there's no way. So I'm <laughs> glad that there's, there's an answer to, for that one. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions. I was wondering if you could, from Ron Fisher, can you show us how you hook up your DSLR to a telescope by any chance? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, let me think about this. Yeah, matter of fact, I can. I've got one right here. I kind of put everything here because I didn't know what I was going to be getting into. So, <laughs> so this, is, this works out. So let me show you. Okay, so can you see, am I on her? You're big deal. Yes. I see you, I don't see me. Oh, sorry, um, I have, I canceled your spotlight so we can both be seen when we each okay. talk, but everybody That's should good. be able to see you. Can I will see that? Really spotlight you. Okay, there yes. we go. Okay, so basically here's the camera. Um, and if I was shooting some wide angle stuff, there's what I've got. So now I wanna put the telescope or the camera in a telescope. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take off the lens. That's the first thing I want to do. So this is important. This, this is the most important part of, out of this is what you're going to need to hook this up to a telescope is two things. You're going to need what they call a T-ring. Oh, there's a camera there. <laughs> a T-ring and a nose piece. Now the nose pieces uh, come in two different sizes. You can get them in either a one and a quarter inch. So if your telescope has a one and a quarter inch hole in it, you can put it in a one and a quarter inch or a two inch. So if your telescope has a two inch hole, you can put the two inch in. So, but you need, first of all, what they call a T ring. And these T rings are proprietary. They have to be made for your specific camera. So in this case here, my camera here is a Canon. So I have a Canon T ring. And what that does, that just basically slips right into the same place that's your lens would. And, and, and the design of this is based on the back of your lens, right? So it's whatever happens on the back of the lens to connect, they're just taking that off and taking the glass out and giving you the, the bones, if you will. So, um, so that goes on there. Then you take your nose piece and typically these are a T42 thread and they just, it, that screws on the front. So now your camera is ready to be inserted into a telescope. So, if I'm going to insert this into this telescope, can you see this? Oh, yeah, I can see that. Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to take my eyepiece out. Okay, I'm not doing visual. 
Now I'm pointed at the moon. I've got things all lined up with my eyepiece so I can make sure the moon's where I want it to be, if that's what I'm shooting. Slip my camera right in. The only thing I'm gonna to have to do now is refocus because your eyepiece where it comes to a focal point is gonna be a little different than where your sensor is on your camera. So that's a very simple thing. If I have a camera like this, that's got the flip out screen, it's, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful thing because now I don't have to get on the ground and look up at my screen to get focus, right? All I have to do is just turn on my camera, up, unlock the mirror, and then go into my, um, my uh, zoom view. So now I can get five times in, do a little focus, get it nice and sharp, press that zoom view again, go 10 times in, get it nice and sharp. So now I know my focus is perfect, it's ready to go. And then I go ahead and I'm not gonna press my hands on this to take the photograph. I'm either A, gonna use the self timer if I don't have a shutter release, or B, if I've got a shutter release, then I'll just go ahead and have that plugged on and then basically just press the shutter. And, and basically that's how you do it. And so that's, that's, to keep it, that's to keep it from wiggling around, eh? Because when you press the shutter button, it wiggles. Yeah, because when you're dealing with a telescope, especially with this focal length, any kind of touch, if I just touch it like this, you'll see the thing shake and that'll ruin your shot, right? Okay, that is a very good tip. That was something that took me a long time to learn and I got really frustrated. But that, <laughs> that like self timer where you press it and then you let it stop wiggling and then yes. it takes a nice photo is key. Yeah. Um, one thing too, as a relative beginner, well, a very beginner astrophotographer, um, that John taught me was when you're focusing a DSLR, and if you want to take, a, like, let's say, star trails, mm -hmm. focus on stars, I found that very difficult. And he suggested just finding a light that is in the distance far away and trying to get it to the smallest point possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's, that's a good way to do it. I, I had such a hard time with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Every, I was getting, everything was out of focus and I didn't know what I was doing. It was really frustrating. Yeah. Um, so that, that is key. Well, you know what, and, 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 uh, and further to that, because that's a really important part, because a lot of these lenses have what they call an infinity, infinity setting on them, but that infinity sometimes don't work, right? Yeah, I, just, I don't know why they do that, yeah. <laughs> so what you have to do is do exactly what you said, Jenna, take that thing and put it to infinity to start, because it'll get you in roughly close in there, but then go ahead and find that distant light um, or, or a tree or a building, something that's off far enough, and then go ahead and do your focus. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, and I think that covers a lot of the sort of the more basic <clears throat> questions. A lot of folks have, um, oh, one last one. Let's start with, let's end with this one. Um, how about some beginner camera lenses? Do you have any recommendations? I know you mentioned a few. Okay, um, I guess it depends on the camera because lenses, uh, lenses can get very expensive and they don't have to. Um, and I'll give you an example. This is a uh, L series Canon lens, 70 to 200 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to buy this new, if it's like an F2 or whatever the case being, these were somewhere around 18, $1,900. Ooh. And I'm only getting 70 to 200. So it's not giving me a lot of reach really. Now, <laughs> got to be Hulk Hogan here for this one. <laughs> so this one is made by a company called Sigma. And this is 150 to 600. Whoa. So, and it was on sale for like $1,200. I mean, that's a lot of money for a lens and that's, I'm not saying go here, but I'm just trying to get, point out to some people who say, well, I got a Canon camera, I got to buy a proprietary lens and they can get really expensive and they don't have to. So you can buy these off brands and that's buying it new. Now you can buy them used for, oh my gosh, way, way, way less than that. But, um, but this lens, I watched um, a fellow actually do a shootout with this lens versus, I think it was around a $12,000 Canon lens. Oh. And there was two of them side by side, bap, 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 you know, doing everything they want to do to shoot. And they were shooting uh, an, air, uh, an air show. And he said there was no way in the world you could justify the difference in price between those two lenses when he was extremely satisfied with what this one can do. So Sigma makes a lot of really, really good lenses. Uh, Sam Yang, uh, Rokinon. There's a lot of very, very good lenses that you can buy for a, a lot, 
a lot less money getting into this kind of glass. Um, other than that, the only one that I would recommend for a kit lens that's very inexpensive, um, if you don't already have it for doing this kind of photography, would be that what they call that nifty 50. And it's only $150. It's a 50 millimeter f1.8. It does have autofocus if you want to use it for, you know, daytime stuff. Um, but uh, it's that one I, I couldn't recommend more. It, it's for Canon. Um, I've not used Nik Nikon or Nikon, so I'm not sure what they would have, but I'm assuming that most of these camera companies are very competitive. So you should be able to find that kind of thing under most, most different brands. And I think that'll cover us all for questions. I will just say briefly that I am also a Canon girl. So I'm glad that we agree on that point because I do not agree with your choice of hockey team, unfortunately. Oh no. <laughs> That's okay. But you know what? You know what? We all finished the same this year. Oh yeah, we did. Yeah. <laughs> terrible. Um, you do have a lot of support from the people in the in the chat though. Everyone was really excited about the Habs. So oh, I will sit quietly and and let you win this one. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your team? I'm too embarrassed to say. Yeah, well, I live here. Yeah. I was born into it. I'm forced to. <laughs> you know what? So was I. So was I. And I'm kind of going through now what you went through for the last, since 1967. <laughs> oh, I would just take that <laughs> knife and twist it, Paul. Oh. I'm just teasing. I love oh, No, it's okay. It's, it's, been, it's been a rough year for everyone. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to just wrap up quickly by announcing the winner of our social media contest oh. um, because we had a little social media astrophotography contest and our winner is, let me check, um, Bob1775. So I'm going to get right. uh, Bob's information and I will send you the Nightwatch book, which was our sort of introductory astronomy book, and then a copy of this issue of Sky News. Sweet. Congratulations. Thanks, thanks for the folks who are participating. We'll see if we can get another one going maybe the next time that we do a photography session. Um, and we'll have a little bit more uh, practice under our belts then hopefully. So thank you so much, Paul, for having us. And thank thanks everybody for joining. If you've got more questions, I have the chat saved as of right now. And so I'll do my best to get back to everybody. Um, and if I can't answer them, Paul, I may send them on to you if that's all right. Okay. <laughs> thanks so much for joining. And uh, we'll, we'll see you all on Thursday to do some Photoshop. Thank you. Bye guys, have a good day.